Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of That Early Childhood Nerd. I'm Heather Burnt Santi, and very excited that we're going to do another conversation today um, with, I guess, the caring crew. Can we call ourselves that? It's part four <laughs> of this illuminating care. There's probably a more clever name, but that wasn't in the moment thing. I so like I'll it. Leave. Perfect. So, um, so, so welcome. I've got uh, Tiffany Pearsall. That's me. That's her. And Richard Cohen. <laughs> hey, yo. All right. And then Carol Garboden Murray. Hello, here. Carol. Um, uh, so I'm going to let you start by just talking about for anyone who might just be jumping into this series or hasn't heard us obsessively fangirling about you in even episodes you're not on. <laughs> okay. um, talk about your book a little bit, and then we'll jump into the conversation we have ready for the, for this episode. Okay, wait. Uh, yes. Before Carol goes, I have to say something. Um, as a as a uh, VDP, a very dramatic person, I feel the need to um, say something right now. Oh, and shocking. that is that in preparation for today's podcast, I reread the chapter in Carol's new book, which will be out any day now. She's going to talk about that. I'm just saying, I'm plugging it. Oh, okay. And so I reread <laughs> the chapter on sleeping and I cried again. <laughs> so here's my question. CGM, why do you do me like that? <laughs> oh my gosh, it makes me feel so happy that people are reading this book before it's in print. And um, I don't know what it is about this book. Um, the name of the book is Illuminating Care. And I hope you will all come to my Facebook page, Illuminating Care, and join me in a book launch, which will be happening really soon, hopefully before the month of February. This book has been in the making for a long time. And um, it feels like a spiral process for me because care is so close to me and so close to all of us who are early childhood teachers. So being able to share it with other people is just really exciting. And I really appreciate all of you who have supported the book in this podcast and, and who've been caring for children through, through your career. Um, it's such essential, important work, and it feels so good to really try to describe what care is. So illuminating care, the pedagogy and practice of care in early childhood communities. Um, please, please come to the Facebook page and join us in the care movement, the care revolution. Yeah, uh, just fair warning, you'll share everything from the Facebook page. Oh. You'll like it, and then you'll share every freaking post true. that comes out well this um, chapter and what we're going to talk about on sleep was so comprehensive um also so eloquently written but also very practical and accessible to people new to the field with lesser literacy levels it, it just to me struck that perfect balance it's everything and more that i've tried to teach people about rest time in early childhood mm -hmm. programs. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Richard. I'm not an academic. I'm a, I'm a preschool teacher. I'm a childcare teacher. And um, so I've just been writing about it as I do it. I'm, I'm still oh, with kids. And I plan to be with kids <laughs> for my whole career. So I, I started the book, ta that chapter talking about my memory because I didn't go to preschool, but I do remember kindergarten. And I do remember, I have this memory of laying on my rest mat and the teacher walking up and down between the aisles. She had the rest mats laying out in rows and she had us all separated. And I just remember her, her, her feet kind of clicking on the, on the floor and her uh, fluctuating with this tone of sternness, lay down, put your head down, be quiet. <laughs> And this tone of, you know, it's rest time, <laughs> trying to be gentle. And um, I remember in my own body, the tension, and this was many, many years ago, the tension of wanting to do what I needed to do, but just feeling like I couldn't relax in, in, in this uh, setting, um, really have, feeling like I was crawling out of my skin. I was a pretty wiggly person. So fall, crawling out of my skin, being told to be re relax and not being able to stay still. And I found that when I talked to 
people about rest time, early childhood teachers tend to have such a big range of experiences and feelings about rest time. Some of them feeling so tender and so connected to that time of day with children and other people feeling like oh, they hate it and it's so stressful and, and they just you know are dealing with kids who can't regulate themselves and parents' expectations about kids sleeping or not sleeping. So um, it seems like the whole range, the whole, the whole gamut of feelings um, from tenderness to frustration exist around this period of the day, rest, rest and sleep. Well, there's a lot of teachers who that's their one time to like get their documentation done or prep their materials or whatever. And it's so frustrating when every kid is not asleep and they have to, some teachers will say they're frustrated because they think that's their one time to get their other things done. And then they're resentful of the children who are awake yeah. and keeping them from getting those things done. Well, and it's also that, that we've, we've, we've blown right past the quote and we've just jumped right in. So, oh, oh, yes, the so the whole Sorry, format nerd. is shot now. <laughs> oh, boy, nice cat eyeglasses, nerd. Shut up. God. <laughs> anyway, but Carol, you, you described the quote, the, the, your, your description of your um, kindergarten nap time experience is where we're going to start. But uh, then moving into the, the reasons that teachers feel like they need to be that um, sort of regimented around nap time is a I think a good first step for this conversation because we have to address that before we can can talk about how you know it could be deeper or better or more caring or whatever but you know for at least in Indiana nap time in a child care center is the only time that um uh teachers the numbers the ratios work out so that teachers can have lunch breaks too because oh. if mm -hmm. if all the children are mm -hmm. sleeping you don't need to have the ratio met so, so you can send people off for lunch oh, breaks and yeah, uh -huh. um, cool. or yeah, like you, if you're one, um, you're the only teacher in the room and your ratio is one to five and you, once that sixth kid wakes up, you need to have someone else in the room with you, but otherwise oh. you can, you can um, be alone with all 10 of your toddlers or whatever, if they're all sleeping. Mm -hmm. So it, mm -hmm. it, there's a lot of programmatic parts oh. that make it stressful, but I, um, am a firm believer and I've done, I've been the one in the classroom. I've been the one in, in the director's office trying to figure out lunch breaks. Um, that it's difficult, but if we're here for children, we're here for children. <laughs> and, and how mm -hmm. do we, so how, how can we, how can we make it better? And I'm, I'm hoping that that's sort of, of where our conversation can be today. Yeah. Oh. Uh, the, the, well, Carol, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I just, I think that's a great place to start. And I think I'm just thinking about some of the things we've done in our school um, over the past few years. And one of them is that all the teachers generally get their lunch break before rest time. Mm -hmm. um, that has helped us a lot because that is a lot of pressure, you know, between one and three, it's a lot of pressure to get kids asleep mm -hmm. and get some prep and get some maybe collaboration conversation with your with your colleague and get a lunch break and and if you're hungry and you're trying to get kids to fall asleep I mean yeah and you're looking at your watch like just go sleep yeah I'm hungry yeah. like yeah. it doesn't help right no 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 <laughs> yeah. it's sort of one of those it, it kind of illuminates this the, the lifestyle of the of the early childhood teacher mm -hmm. and the kind of things we ask of them right I mean mm -hmm. I recently talked to someone who said that she got a like an hour paid unpaid lunch break because her director wanted her to come early enough to greet the children and wanted her to stay late enough to be there at the end of the day. So she had this like long day with a, an oh. hour in the middle that was unpaid. I've worked and, that day. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. And yeah. oh, wow. I mean, we do ask, we, we, uh, we're a lot of, a lot is asked of us. Mm -hmm. So I think that yeah. that is also another good place to start yeah. is we've been asked to do. Yeah. I just, I, you know, I want to acknowledge mm -hmm. that. I know that's the reality. Yes. Um, and I know that I want, so I guess I sort of want to say that so that people who are listening don't automatically shut off with their, okay, but that won't work in my, because we have to do it this way and we have to do it that way. I know that that's, that's a reality. But when I think back, I mean, I have seen in 30 years of working with young children, a lot of really uncaring interactions and expectations and tones of voice during nap time and around nap time um, mm -hmm. that break my heart. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why this, this topic and all the topics we've talked about 
um, or all the, the aspects we've talked about of your, your book, Carol, this, this one really, um, you know, Richard described having a strong, strong reaction to it. It's, it, it's hooked me. Um, so I want to, mm-hmm. I want to, I want to hear, I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to listen for a minute because I want to hear what you all are thinking about it. Well, I want to lay one more foundation too. Mm-hmm. Um, so we just laid the foundation we, of the teacher's experience by acknowledging how challenging and stressful and exhausting it is, right? Mm-hmm. And, but I also want to just put in there, um, which you know I knew, but Carol v- reminded me of and validated in that chapter when I read it this morning, um, of, which is rest time from the young child's point of view, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? So all of a sudden there's less light in the room. Um, everything is suddenly quiet. I'm mm-hmm. in a, theoretically, I'm being asked to be in a prone position on the ground. And for any member of the animal kingdom, uh, all your instincts fight against that because you're the most vulnerable when you're lying down on the ground, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so we need to remember for children, um, what that's like for them, uh, how scary that moment in the day can be. It's when you most want mommy or whoever, mm-hmm. um, because you're very vulnerable and defenseless and it's dark and maybe you're scared of the dark. And um, you have to always remember that when you, when you plan your, and when you intentionally plan your strategies mm-hmm. for how to care for them and how to Mm -hmm. support them through that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of where I really appreciate, Carol, what you have to say in your book is that we start to look at nap time and these acts of care as things that might need scaffolding to learn. Uh You Like when you are a child who's never slept in a place beside on your mama, and now you're asked to be put by yourself in a crib next to six other babies, with the lights you, on with the lights on and people <laughs> crying around you and smells and all sounds and doorbells opening um you have to learn how to do that and i think that teachers because we have overlooked these aspects of care as teaching moments because honestly they all start with the care we just kind of assume like well if you're tired you'll sleep and i don't think that's entirely true mm-hmm. i think a child Um, you know, some children who have been scaffolded at home in certain ways and um, sort of come with that pre-existing knowledge might be able to just lay down and go to sleep if they're tired. But other children, especially at nap time, because they're tired, Mm -hmm. are reaching out for help and not getting it. Mm -hmm. Instead, they're getting you, you know, taking away their blankets and we're never going to get up ever again. Like, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> nice. so, you know, how, how do you scaffold that experience? Yeah. I just have to tell you when Josie was three years old, I worked in the center that she attended and from down the hall, I could hear her screaming. I want my Molly. Cause they had taken oh. her doll away because she wouldn't lay still. And the way that she oh. fell asleep, I'm sorry, the way that they fell asleep, um, was to be on their belly with their legs twisted, their butt in the air and wiggling. And that's how yeah. they sort of regulated to fall asleep. And they didn't like that. And they took her doll, their doll away for, for that. And um, that is seared into my brain as a parent and a teacher. <laughs> having heard that and seen that and, the, and, and then having that adult defending it in good, you know, like mm-hmm. in good conscience that they thought they were doing the right thing because mm-hmm. it was nap time and everybody needs to go to sleep. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I discovered this author, Tova Klein. I don't know if you've heard of her. She wrote a great book about uh, caring for young children. Um, and she talks a lot about rest and sleep being a surrender, a transition, a, a goodbye. It's another separation mm-hmm. for children mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that the tenderness that's required for them to, to experience another another separation and, and a separation where you're experiencing yourself, you're, you're alone when you fall asleep, right? Usually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's and the part talks- that made me cry. Yeah. Oh. And she you, talks you write about, about Tova, Tova's and kind of uh, an excerpt there within your book. 
Yeah, she's great. And she talks about children having these um, extra rituals within rituals. And, I, and that really struck me because I started thinking about kids like that. Maybe they stick their butt in the air. <laughs> Maybe, you know, they're almost like puppies. They, they have a way of arranging their pillow or sitting up and laying down or flipping their feet up or kicking their feet against the, against the wall. You see them and you start, if you really can let them have a little bit of time to settle in, you start to see that they have these ways of winding down and and they do need to to develop their own ritual for making that transition from active to calm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if you think your job is to control them right which so many people do um mm -hmm. that's never what you just described is never going to happen mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. the first thing is to understand that it feels counterintuitive if i could control what happens in this transition to nap time, then I can get to cutting out my red triangles faster <laughs> in construction paper. Um, but it's like everything else, a leap of faith. You can't control it. You, you have to support children in doing their own thing in their own way. And mm -hmm. if you take that leap of faith, magic happens. Mm -hmm. We have a little boy in our program right now who really can't regulate during rest time. And so the teacher just, you know, she's, she's going a little nuts um, because we, I have her, her Thursday afternoon, I've given her prep time. And so there's supposed to be a sub that goes in there to take her room while she goes and works on her documentation. And, you know, she really appreciates that time, but being the, the caring, loving teacher she is, she says, I just can't leave my room with a yeah. sub, not well, at this time of day, this mm -hmm. kid needs me more mm -hmm. than ever. So mm -hmm. I was so happy she came to me and, and explained that to me. She just feels like she can't do it to the sub and she can't do it to this kid. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we just changed her prep time to, to the morning when the kids all go out for their big, big block of outdoor time, which, you know, she hates mm -hmm. to miss that too. <laughs> a, sub, a sub can do that, right? A sub can be there when the children are mm -hmm. running around the playground. Um, but a sub is going to have a harder time covering her room for this little boy who depends on her and who has some yeah. significant special needs. Right. Yeah, Especially if it's just that one that time too. Right. Yeah. If it's well, every day at that time. No, it's just like one the, week, right? Yeah. yeah. And that, that's, that's where it's hard to explain to other people like, yeah, they're all kind of laying in one place, but if the person that's their person isn't there to help with the helping every day at the same time in the same way, and like slowly backing off to give them independence as needed, then it's gonna not, we're starting from scratch here, guys. <laughs> like let's all be in the same place on our mats. Like our mats are in the exact same place with the same things every day. And the same person comes and goes through the same ritual because that's part of it. That predictability of routine is part of it. And, you know, when you, when you, suddenly change it every day like of course it's going to be hard yep when i was a director uh i learned pretty quickly that uh the beginning of nap time is the worst time to rotate a sub in for all the reasons yeah. that we're talking about and mm -hmm. so um i just always jumped in it, in those moments because i knew all every single of the 90 kids in the school i was mm -hmm. like the one person that knew them all as the director so mm -hmm. I'm like, no, 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 I'll be there because they know me and I can lay down on the floor and rub their backs and sing and tell mm -hmm. stories. Um, mm -hmm. But if we put a sub in there, I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to lose that sub because it's too stressful <laughs> yeah. for this person yeah. who has less skills even than my teachers. Right. It's not fair to that sub either to put them right. in that situation. Mm -hmm. And the children are just going to be even worse yeah. when that teacher gets mm -hmm. back in the room. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make sense. No. I think the only time that it works, we have it set up where our afternoon person comes in at the beginning of lunch. Mm. So they get that like, oh, she's here. Elena's yeah. here. They like get the excitement out while they're eating. And then like, she is part of the ritual at that point. Mm. It's when you bring someone in midway through that, like <gasps> all the heads get up and look around and, <gasps> and you have to reset. <laughs> you have to bring them in before you lower the lights if your state mm -hmm. even allows you to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's the other end of it, right? When kids wake up before 3 p.m. Yeah. and there's someone mm -hmm. there they don't know. Oh yeah, that's a also other not great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, very true. Also, you're not allowed to lower the lights in some states? Mm -hmm. it's, oh, yeah, that is that. correct. 
I didn't know that. <laughs> not well, only some often- states. Go ahead. Not only some states, but like I worked for a franchise center, a center that's part of a nationwide franchise and a center in like Washington had had a, something happen with a child during nap time, disappeared or something because of darkness. So then no classrooms in the franchise could have their lights off during rest time. Um, and that lasted about a week. And then we all started turning our lights off again because no one yeah. was there to, to, to know we were doing it wrong. But it's that it was just funny that suddenly this one, this is our answer, right? No more dimmed lights in that time. <laughs> yep. I'm, I'm a little intense about it. I dim the lights before they even come in for lunch. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, what I found as some, as an early childhood person who's moved around too many times in his life. And so have become familiar with licensing regs in many different States. Mm-hmm. Um, What quite often happens is that people think they misread the licensing regs and they Mm -hmm. think they're supposed to leave the lights on. And then Mm -hmm. I check with the um, licensor and they say, no, no, that's not. You just need to be able to visually see every child. Mm -hmm. You do not have to have the lights all the way on. And then I have to like re-educate people because people tend to people tend to make black and white assumptions about licensing regs when there's often Mm -hmm. a lot more gray in there that's possible. Mm -hmm. Or um, that you even have to have nap time at that time of the day for that length of time. Like a lot of regs, I think just say a period of rest or something about rest. And like here in Indiana, it's a period of rest. And if after 30 minutes, they're not sleeping, they have to be given something else to do. And the way that gets interpreted is y'all have to lay down um, and after 30 minutes, if you're not asleep, I'll give you the same book I gave you yesterday <laughs> yeah. to keep you busy for the next two hours <laughs> until, until I can let you off your cot. Um, yeah. so a lot of assumptions pretty globally about licensing, but I think it, particularly around resting and rest time. And what yep. I, th- I think childcare culture comes into play, but we assign it to licensing or regulators. Mm-hmm. Really, mm-hmm. it's just sort of the way that, that we've come to do things. And I, well, I also the- think that I also think that there's not a lot of background research about how to nap. That's why I was thrilled to see this chapter in this book. <laughs> well, let's talk remember, about that. <laughs> yeah. As, as one of my like professional development goals, my second year teaching, I was like, I'm going to figure out how to nap. And I found like three articles on napping and that was it. I love a good deep article, Google Scholar, Nerd Drive. And I found three things. Like, of course, this is hard and no one's having fun. We don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So really thinking about like, how do you embrace sleep and get better at it by learning more about it as a teacher? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you create a circadian rhythm that goes along with the children in your care? How do you make it dark enough, but not so dark that they get confused in their bodies and sleep for six hours. Like, you know, like finding that balance. And I didn't really learn any of that until I had Guy, until I had my own kid and we were going through the like sleepless nights. And finally it's like, oh, all the sleep information is for babies. There's all this information about getting your baby to sleep because parents are there trying to get their baby to sleep and it's affecting their sleep too. But as soon as those kids are out of the home, it's like, and nap time, whatevs. <laughs> where, where is that background knowledge? Where, where is that support for it's educators? In Carol's book. I was gonna it's say, in so Carol's book. Carol, tell us, tell us about it. <laughs> oh man, I, I did the best I could, but I, I felt the same way that Tiffany feels. Is like there isn't a lot of research about it, and even the research you find about it says this is new research, and we need more research about preschoolers and sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, this idea that, that children naturally go through growth spurts where they consolidate their sleep, you know, they, when they're babies, they might sleep two or three times during the day. And then when they're toddlers, they're sleeping that one nice big afternoon nap. And then mm-hmm. the preschooler might, the, that nap time might get shorter. And then, or disappear. you know, and, or it might disappear <laughs> and we see, and then, and then trying to understand each individual child's pattern within the context of a group, I think is the biggest challenge. But it, for me, it was great to know that it is normal for, for those, for those 
four-year-olds to be having a harder time falling asleep. And it is normal that if they can consolidate their sleep at night, they are going to get better sleep. And that's one thing the research tells us that mm -hmm. if we force a kid who is in that consolidation phase to, to get a nap, it could interrupt his nighttime sleep because we always feel sort of irritated at parents when they say, don't let them sleep because it's ruining their nighttime. And there is that, that sort of tension between what, the, what we can do at our school and what parents might want us to do to support their evening rituals um, mm -hmm. and how much of it, of it is supported by research, how much, how much of it is supported just by different, different sort of lifestyles and expectations on children and schedules and sleep. So I don't know, because there's so little research, for me, I found this approach where I ask myself, how can I value rest and quiet and solitude within my program, even if children don't sleep? How can I take mm -hmm. the pressure mm -hmm. off the falling asleep thing, but still realizing the kids might be in our care for 40, 50 hours a week. So we're not gonna, <laughs> we're not gonna do without a rest time, even for those four and five-year-olds, but maybe there's a way to make it more gentle, make it mm -hmm. uh, help children learn to regulate, show our value on solitude, having some time alone, show our value on daydreaming and regulation and peaceful, periods of the day mm -hmm. and 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 when we can get to that you know i do think we start to feel that tenderness we do start to feel like we're a family with those those four and five year olds in the afternoon who who might not be sleeping anymore but they mm -hmm. are learning to be alone mm -hmm. on their with their cozy blanket and they are mm -hmm. quiet and they are taking a break mm -hmm. And but often I, learning how to read independently is what I found. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, That's a good goal, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I think the first thing we need to do as a profession toward that goal is to stop calling it nap time mm -hmm. and start mm -hmm. calling it rest time. Mm -hmm. Because we have mm -hmm. a lot of lovely, you know, we have a 43% attrition rate in this profession. So every annual attrition rate. So every mm -hmm. year we have new people coming in <clears throat> who aren't fully educated uh, on mm -hmm. how to do early childhood. Mm -hmm. And so they see on that daily schedule hanging on, hanging on the wall, nap time. And they think my job is to get each of the children to nap. And when they don't do mm -hmm. that, then either I'm not good at my job or the children aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing and I need to uh, deliver a consequence, mm -hmm. but it's rest time. It's not time to nap. If you want to use the time rest, rest time for napping, great, I'm there for you. But if you want to just lay on your cot um, and look at books or play with quiet toys, that's fine too. It's not bad or good because mm -hmm. it's not nap time. It's rest time. Mm -hmm. And I think some teachers, it seems I'm not, I've never been that great on getting the whole group to sleep. I mean, but it does seem like there is some teachers who are better at it than I am. I mean, that just can really shift into that model of calmness and regulation and just be an anchor for those kids. And, and like Tiffany said, have those, those rituals. One of my teachers now does a little breathing, she rings a bell. And a few times that I've stepped in to help her, they're like, Carol, you didn't ring the bell or, you know, you didn't do this. She has a little, like a little um, singing bowl. I mean, mm -hmm. and I, I am so impressed with the way those four and five-year-olds will just take a break. And now she's even started something at the end of rest time where she will say, we're gonna have whisper time. And she'll let like two of them be close to each other doing a puzzle together. You know, you can have buddy whisper time. Mm. And I thought, well, that's mm -hmm. really cool too because um, she's deciding who's gonna be with who. And she says she likes kind of pairing certain children up that haven't played together during the day. And they, mm -hmm. they're so excited to be able to have this, this buddy whisper time next to one of their peers at the end of the last time. It feels, like a, it feels like a privilege, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so I think teachers are very creative with this time of day. They can be, if, if it is looked at as a, a learning, time if it's looked if it's valued as, as as part of the curriculum and that we can also have these conversations with families you know when kids are going through the growth spurts and they're outgrowing their naps because the families are saying to us oh my god he's so exhausted he falls asleep on in the car or he's he's a bear during dinner time you know I you know and we can just say yeah we know it's hard right now it's hard because 
there's this growth spurt going on. There's this mm -hmm. consolidation going on. It's not necessarily our fault that he's not falling asleep anymore. Um, you know, maybe we, if the parent really wants him to sleep and he it's taking him a long time to fall asleep and he's restless, maybe we can support their desires in some way, but also just support them in knowing that that that's normal to have a, a, a grumpy afternoon when you're, when you're consolidating your sleep at night and it's hard to make it through dinner. <laughs> and, and I think just to acknowledge that like, this is a big expectation we have on children to be in childcare all day. Um, mm -hmm. It's yeah. our 40 hour work week is, is, is not, is not very kind to yeah. children and families. Yeah. <laughs> so we have to remember that piece. And what you're describing, Carol, in that, um, you know, those interactions with families when the child hasn't napped like they want them to, or maybe wants them not to nap, but they're still sleeping with us at our, at our site. Um, it takes, it takes a mature and skilled teacher to navigate those conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and I mean, mature, like, uh, I don't mean that like, it, um, like the opposite is an insult, I guess. I, I just mean there's some some time and skill that comes mm -hmm. with knowing how to navigate that because otherwise it's it's really easy for us to slip into the customer is always right mode. Oh, the parent wants this, so we have to do this here, which is not always um, the the most effective or the you know in the child's best interest. But also there's that element that. Yeah, I would love it too if they slept all through nap time and weren't so grouchy in the afternoon. And now the parent has validated that. So I'm going to crack down harder on the non-sleepers. So we really have to think about that aspect of it too. Um, mm -hmm. How can we change our focus during rest time, um, become more, more caring and observant so that when those conversations come up, we can approach it from, yeah, we've noticed that, too, you know, just what you're describing. We've noticed that too, his sleep has changed here. Here's what, you know, here's what we're doing and what we think we're support, how we think we're supporting him. And just those kinds of conversations instead of either teaming up two adults now against the child or teacher versus parent and the child somewhere in the middle. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I think that's also a really murky, uh, some murky water to try and get through. Yeah. It gives us that invitation to help parents understand what the day of the child is, what, it, what is the day in the life of a, a child in, in, in group care? You know, yeah. even like sometimes I see like maybe a child, a parent will come at like five o'clock in the afternoon and they'll see their child sitting alone you know, maybe daydreaming or looking at a book and the parent will say, wow, why is she alone? You know, doesn't mm -hmm. she have any friends? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm worried about her. Why isn't she playing? Why isn't she learning? And, yeah. and just to say, she's well, been here since 630 in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's Thursday afternoon and it's, yeah. it's a great skill that she has that she can move off and sit by herself and, and look at a book. And, and we value alone time mm -hmm. and we value quiet time. And we want the child to regulate their states mm -hmm. throughout the day. This is a big day right. this is a big day for kids so so rest doesn't just have to happen in those two hours after lunch either then I, I think yeah. is, is another point it might be that end of the day when they sort of take themselves off with a book and and do something alone mm -hmm. I'd like to hear more about Tiffany since she, you're in there with the kids some of the things that you're doing that's making rest time work. um can I instead tell you a story about our most magical sub yes sir and then I'll tell you what I do Okay. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. So we were talking about how um, I struggle with nap time. Uh, it's just like, I love sleep so much. It, <laughs> I just like could easily lay down and go to sleep. And so when I see kids struggling, it's sometimes hard for me to empathize almost of like, I'm friggin' exhausted. I've seen what you've done all day. How are you not tired? <laughs> um, but we had a new teacher who was Waldorf trained and went to a Waldorf college. Mm -hmm. and one of her first or second days um, I, something came up and I couldn't be in the room for nap and she just said I think she sat down and everyone's kind of milling about getting to that calm down and she's just kind of waiting and she says I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna read a book and then close my eyes for a bit <laughs> and she sat down next to you know there's always the like fire starter she sat down next to the one that once they're calm everyone else is like mm -hmm. oh okay I can. Mm -hmm. He's not going to, okay, I can rest now. So she <laughs> sat down next to him and she read one of the books that he had picked. And then she wadded up her sweatshirt and laid with her face facing him and closed her eyes. 
And when I came back, every single child in the room was asleep. And that was all she had done. That was a sub? That Well, she, she was like a floater and then a sub for a while. She never was with us full time. I tried. She looked yes, too far away. You should have fired someone else and given her that job. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we tried to keep her. She lives far away. Um, but that really, that was the moment that nap time really changed for me. That was the light bulb that she modeled it. She scaffolded it. Her attitude was just cool as a cucumber. And it's enjoyable. That's like the secret to any child that really struggles to get into that resting zone that still does need the rest. Mm -hmm. Just like, I'm just going to lay here with my eyes closed next to you for 10 minutes. And I'm going to think about all the fun things we've done this morning. Maybe I'll have like a hand on your back. Sometimes a like dead hand that's really heavy or, or I'll, you know, just be like stroking your hair, you know, whatever your thing is. And we're just going to be here for 10 minutes. And if after that 10 minutes, you're just like, bing, right back up, then clearly like we've had this downtime together <clears throat> and I'm ready to get up with you now. <laughs> and I think that that has really changed a lot of how we do nap time in our room, at least. I love Because like suddenly it's fulfilling for the teachers too. And I know we're here for the kids, but part of what makes nap time so hard is that teachers aren't getting any of the rewards in their minds, right? Like when you're having that dynamic outdoor experience and you're taking pictures of the risk taking and look at the learning, like you're, you're not perceiving that at rest time. You're just perceiving it's not working. So how can you switch that so that you can perceive like, this is what the learning looks like and this is what nap time working looks like that's so good and and if you have this expectation on yourself that you're going to you know do some planning and reflecting and documenting and mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. then it's going to be hard to model that rest and to take that rest mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so all these all these uh, sort of programmatic mm -hmm. considerations they cost money right to have to not yeah. to get those lunch breaks <laughs> A little earlier to, mm -hmm. to have that extra person mm -hmm. to cushion in there so the teacher's not frazzled at rest time so the teacher can yeah be but emotional. we we won't put that effort into finding the budget for it until we believe in the value of it or that it can be successful in that way so um, exactly. so that's a starting point is thinking the dream is the starting point and mm -hmm. then you start looking for how do I get and there? I think it's pretty easy. I mean, we do our lunch breaks during nap time, but in the beginning, like when we were on, when I was on a school year schedule, it was just assumed like, we're going to take what it takes for the first three weeks. And maybe it'll be 10 minute lunch breaks. And maybe it'll be that I'm eating in a quiet corner with the three that are asleep. <laughs> <laughs> but we know that once we do that groundwork and we establish this community of rest, you get that time later, but you have to actually do the work first. That's a really good point. It takes, it takes those first three, four weeks of observing and, and figuring out mm -hmm. the best spots for children who are, who are exhausted and need mm -hmm. a quiet corner right mm -hmm. away. And, and um, yeah, individualizing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So That's Richard, good. you wanted to tell us how you do things. How do you do nap? Well, First of all, I want to just go back and say another thing I so appreciated, Carol, in this chapter was how um, Tiffany was talking about putting a hand on the back and all that. And um, you were so, in the book, you're so um, granular. Uh, you, go, you go into such level of detail um, about different ways to, uh, there's a whole subsection on touch and there's a whole list mm -hmm. and I'm different than Tiffany in that I get a lot of reward during nap time. I love <laughs> nap time. It's so intimate. It's my favorite time of day. Um, I find it super rewarding. <laughs> and so I have my ways of rubbing backs and all that. Um, I, I um, believe in early childhood in evidence-based practices, but the one myth that I hold to is that uh, children will fall asleep if you rub their backs clockwise, but if you rub them counterclockwise, you'll wind them up. I've never even heard that. Same. That one goes back. I'm gonna try it. Grandma's. Older, even than me. It works for me. <laughs> Evidence be damned. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Carol gives all of these different ways of touch, 
that I never thought of before. And I just so appreciated that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, um, I have a whole different set of songs to sing than the rev them up songs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all of my kids know yeah. inchworm, inchworm, measuring the marigolds. It's very repetitive. It's mm -hmm. very slow. Ernie sang it on Sesame Street in the 70s. Remember that oh. little Muppet, <laughs> the little caterpillar Muppet? Yeah. Um, okay. yeah. I have two versions of um, second person storytelling that I do. Second person means you are doing this or it's, it's stories about the kids. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One is what I call magic stories. Um, and all the kids can do magic in those stories. It's, it's always like every week was, every Wednesday was magic story day and they knew that. And it was a chance for me to weave in whatever they were talking about or they always go on an adventure and there's something happens in the story. And for the children who can't keep their hands to themselves um, in the story, they can. <laughs> and the ones who are shy in the story, they yell out and save the day. And it's pretty amazing. It gives them an opportunity to see what's possible for them. Um, ways of being that are possible that they haven't yet experienced success at yet in real life. But in the stories, it's, I'm very intentional in who does what and what I'm working on, what skills I'm working on with that job. The other one are, are ones that I call Richard's patented boring stories. Yeah. I've heard boring of stories. <laughs> hey. No, you have not. No. <laughs> you heard stories that happen to be boring. You're right. You're not right. stories that were okay. designed to be boring. Fine. Um, and Carol alludes to them in, in her book. Um, you are, okay, you are walking through the forest and you are a turtle. And you put one foot and then the other foot. And blah, 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 blah. And you <laughs> swings and you swing back and forth. And you get to the big building and you go up the elevator. You go up, up, up. And it's guaranteed. I get <laughs> royalties for that. Amazing. I have, I, I can't do the storytelling at nap time because I get too into it and it revs them up every time. <laughs> <laughs> like I can't not like I've also my husband makes fun of me a lot that like every story I tell is somehow a scary story <laughs> it's just too suspenseful what's going to happen next so I can't tell my own stories but I definitely have a stash of boring books huh? that are for Little me the magic books. <laughs> Some well, books, books from books the aren't quite, they're not quite long enough for me, oh. honestly. Well, you haven't found the tawny scrawny lion. Oh, I, we do have that one. Oh, I love okay. that one. Um, little toot is my oh, nap sure. time secret. If I am sitting with you and we're reading little toot and the flag on his masthead waves like the tail of a puppy dog. <laughs> like if you're not asleep by the end of that book, you're not going to go to sleep. <laughs> Without it. <laughs> also Virginia Lee's the little house I think that's her name about the little house that the little house no, yeah no. the little house mm -hmm. that one's a good one all Dr. Seuss books except for hop on pop nope sorry okay. except for green eggs and ham that yeah. one's just too oh. exciting mm. but like at that time. oh we love like they're long enough that you get bored and the rhythm you can just Read one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. See, that's a way in which we're alike. That revs me up. Dr. Seuss yeah, books revs me that up. That wouldn't work. <laughs> the King's Stilts, maybe some of those longer mm, yeah. mythology numbers, but mm. yeah. Bartholomew and the Ooblek. Mm -hmm. That's a, yeah. 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 A Stephen well, King it's... book always works. A for Stephen me. King <laughs> book. <laughs> <laughs> and then we read the stand and learn how to continue in this <laughs> pandemic life. <laughs> no, but I will tell you um, the greatest thing I ever saw for nap time, for rest time. Um, mm -hmm. I was, an, I was uh, on a consulting gig. So I was um, at, a, at a center, one center for a week, um, evaluating and, and, and mentoring and all that. Um, but you know, in a week's time, you get to know all the kids, at least I do, you get to know all mm -hmm. the kids and they know you 
and you know within the first half a day mm -hmm. and so in this one center uh they had a lawn a wicker laundry basket and it was full of those dollar store little photo albums um and each family was asked to take it home at the beginning of the school year and fill it with photos of their child's family, favorite places, pets, whatever it was. And then on the outside, the teacher had written in large Sharpie marker, the child's name in black Sharpie marker, capitalized first letter, the whole thing. And one of the jobs on the job helper chart was to help the teacher get ready for nap time. And while the teacher was putting out the cots, uh, the children took turns. They had to figure out what the name was on that book. They could look at the pictures inside too and match it to the mat and put it on the mat so that when the kids came in That's for great. nap time, everyone had their little photo album on their mat. And as I sat there during nap time, once the kids knew me, they would say, Richard, come over here, come over here. Sure, what? I want to show you my book. Okay. Or... I want to show you my book. <laughs> used a whisper voice like me. And they, because it's such a vulnerable time, that family, that little photo album of familiar faces and their pet and all those things calmed them down amazingly. And this is my dog. And, you know, last week he pooped on the rug and, you know, all that. And those fo little photo albums were spectacular. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's wonderful. Yes, brilliant. Yeah. yeah. I had, I asked families to um, take home a class, a book from the classroom that I knew the children liked, record themselves reading it. And there was one group right away that I used that with that would really settle that, settle down for nap time. And each day it was a different person's mom or dad reading. And then like, you know, that group aged and moved on. And I had a whole new group when I tried it again. And they were so wound up by it that we had to move that to the end of nap time. <laughs> Mm -hmm, and like, let's do mm -hmm. it when it was time to start waking up. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, some things that work really well with one bunch may not uh, always work, but it's, it's observing, it's knowing your children, it's having a few strategic tricks that you can use um, mm -hmm. for the actual mechanics of getting them uh, into that rest time, but mm -hmm. none of it will work if we're drill sergeants. Yeah. And if we're not paying attention to the children that are actually in front of us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah but it's wonderful um, to have to hear all these strategies and, and to think about giving teachers more of a voice, you know, teachers who have been mm -hmm. teaching for so many years who haven't had a curriculum around, they have a curriculum around rest time, like you all have explained, but they haven't had a chance to talk about it or to share it. There's mm -hmm. or had them. somebody tell them, yeah, that's a curriculum around that's yeah. that, that yeah. thing that you yeah. think is just a weird thing you stumbled across in your problem mm -hmm. solving is mm -hmm. actually pedagogy. <laughs> Well, the, the basket of quiet toys that never gets played with any other time in the uh -huh. day, but nap time, uh -huh. is mm -hmm. a key, is a key piece of equipment to have mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. set of equipment, whatever. Yeah. Um, can I tell a pandemic nap story? Yeah. Go for it. So uh, my good friend Nikki at the school I used to work at um, across the river from me. She, there's no, she works in a public school. There are no other children on campus except for her classroom because she has all of the teacher's kids, right? And so because there's nobody in the whole school, she was like, I guess we're going to move our classroom into the gym because it's the biggest <laughs> room in the whole place. And instead of having kids bring school supplies or blankets, I mean, they obviously brought their special things from home. She had all of the parents buy cheap pop tents from Walmart. Oh. They each got these like little floop, pop it up tent. And every kid had their own tent. How do they and work again? The floop. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. You know, like the laundry hampers. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> we continue. Yeah. Yeah. like sound effects. Uh-huh. <laughs> And because they were in the gym, they actually never had to take them down. She would just like scoot them to this corner and there's a little city of tents. But at nap time, they would all, they all have their own little tent and their special toys and their books. And she said after lunch, they would just like beeline and every single kid slept. Love that. <laughs> and she didn't have to do anything. Granted, she would, be, she's willing to do all the things. She's the nap master. But she was just like, they're so excited to have, because they, 
they also need this alone time and don't know how to get it. And suddenly it's like, oh yeah, we're all, you know, little islands in our little tents now. That's Wish great. We had room for tents. Have you ever had a classroom nap outside? I have not, but I'm not yet. See pictures awesome. of it. Yeah. yeah. We're yeah. working on it. Oh, we're working on it. <laughs> well, I was, when I was last a director, it was at a nature preschool. Uh, so mm -hmm. we had lovely outdoor spaces. And mm -hmm. on beautiful days, the chance to nap outside, throw down blankets on the grass and feel the warmth of the sun. That was lovely. Nice. That's our, that's our goal for this summer. Awesome. We just have to like cart the actual nap things with us wherever we go. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a tricky, mm. how do we get it all there? Yeah, th there are some logistics to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know people who do it though. So it's got to be, I mean, the yeah, answers possible. are out there. There are folks mm -hmm. who do it all the time mm -hmm. and it's so cool to see mm -hmm. and think about. Um, although I'm not a summertime outside person, so uh, that would be tricky for me. Um, I feel like we need to wrap this up. I don't really want to because Whoa. I also wanted to talk about consent and body autonomy during rest time. And oh yeah. That. So I've just got that written down here. And when I forget that I said we'd record about that, Richard will remind me. Yeah, that's a huge topic. Uh, and we'll mm -hmm. and we'll schedule mm -hmm. some time to talk about that. Um, maybe between now and then I can learn about it and then I'll know what I'm talking about. Um, I class. thought we were going to talk about it in regards to nap time right now because it's really important. Right. Well, yeah, but we've gone for like an hour already. Um, that is making a stop. I, you, yeah. We got to stop. Either we have to stop now or I have to edit later and I don't like to edit. <laughs> no, so we'll come back to that one. Um, right. What? Oh, Nothing. just fine. You're just pouting. I see. Fine. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, thank you all. This was great. Um, uh, thank you again, Carol. I know we keep saying it, um, but I, I just love what you're Carol, doing. you put so words to our feelings it. and it yes. feels lovely. A little bit, I have a little, little bit of me that's resentful that you got to it first, but no, um, you're no. <laughs> I mean, I feel like no, not like, really at all, <laughs> no, no. but that's exactly what I feel like is happening. And that's exactly why I think people are going to really love this is that um, there's probably a lot of people who are like, yes, I just couldn't, I couldn't articulate it. And then you take it deeper even. Yep. I think the second edition is, is being written while we talk about it. Ooh. Like we moved like beyond it and it hasn't notes, even Carol. gotten published yet. <laughs> With like all your stories. Yep. What did you say, Richard? She was taking notes. She was writing something. I know. I <laughs> if I suddenly oh, yeah. find my patented story, boring story in your next book. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> You'll be, you'll be credited. You'll come up with another boring story. Mm, if there's money in it, I'll sue. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. All the right. lucrative business of nap time scaffolding, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All that big, boring story money being stolen mm -hmm. out from under him. <laughs> yeah, I got to keep myself in that, those big ECE bucks. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to hit stop on the recording. Thank you, everybody, Thank for you. Uh, Thank being you. here. And thanks to everyone who listened. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Please come back again for another episode. Bye.